Hey folks, it's Mangrel. Welcome back to the channel. And we're doing the first flight on our Frankenstein Tango 2 Pro. This is the one that we modified to add in the 250 milliwatt ELRS module internal to the actual remote. So I'll give you a link in the description to how we did that modification. So we're doing the first flight, but equally importantly, I want to check out this guy. This is a happy model EP2 receiver. So this thing is tiny. This is the same size as my fingernail, actually maybe a little bit smaller, but really impressively, it's got a built-in antenna. So that little tiny gray thing over here, that's a built-in ceramic antenna. And this is the main reason why I wanted to check out ELRS because of these tiny receivers and this EP2 in particular. And we're gonna use this quad for the initial flight. This is my QAVS mini three inch freestyle. And I have converted this back into the Vista and you can see where I've put the actual EP2 receiver. So not in a very ideal spot because the antenna is covered up by the top deck and the carbon plates, but we'll see how this performs. We'll see how this performs and go from there. Bear in mind that there are two different versions of each of these. There's two versions of the EP2 and there's two versions of the EP1. The newer version is called the TCXO, which stands for Temperature Controlled Crystal Oscillator. And that means that the crystal that controls the 2.4 gigahertz on these receivers has an additional circuit, which helps it compensate for swings in temperature. So me flying this in minus 20 degrees Celsius and then flying it in plus 40 degrees Celsius, that additional circuit helps it better kind of stick to that 2.4 gigahertz. And the newer version, the TCXO, has a purple board, whereas the old version has a black board. So my links in the video description are to the newer TCXO. So I suggest you purchase these. So let's start off with the smallest receiver. This is the EP2. So you can see that tiny antenna on there. And these weigh so little, I have to use a jewelry scale. So this guy here weighs 0.44 grams. And now if I compare this with the bigger cousin, I mean, slightly bigger cousin, this is the EP1. So let's weigh just the receiver itself. So just the receiver itself is 0.44. Let's add the smaller of the two antenna, 0.93. So under one gram for this. Let's try the longer one, 1.09. So you can see this thing weighs barely anything. Now I already mentioned that this wires up no different than the Crossfire receiver, which means it's got four wires. First one is the ground, next one is the five volt, then we have the TX and then we have the RX. So unfortunately these do not come with the cables, but hey, I'm sure you've got a lot of cables lying around. And the way we're gonna wire this is ground, of course, will go to ground. So on the iFlight flight controller, this is the Success F7. I'm using this particular ground point here then five volts goes over here to five volts. And now on your flight controller, make sure you read the manual because some flight controllers have particular five volt pads that are powered by the USB port and others that are not. So if that's the case with your flight controller, make sure you use the one that is powered by the USB port. That way, if you're working on the bench, you plug in the USB cable, you have the receiver now powered. So that's pretty straightforward. And then here's where, you know, sometimes people get confused, but this is TX, this is RX. TX connects to RX and RX connects to TX. Always bear that in mind. So very simple kind of wiring, but now that we have this wired up, let's switch over to the computer and we're gonna now update the firmware. We're gonna set up beta flight and then we should be good for our first flight. So now we're gonna open up our beta flight configurator. We're gonna connect over to our flight controller. We're gonna go under ports and we're gonna make sure the UART that we connected this receiver to. So remember those orange and yellow cables, we connected those to a particular UART on the flight controller. In my case, it was UART4, so R4 and T4. And I'm gonna make sure to turn on the serial RX on that particular UART. Everything else is left as defaults. I will click on save and reboot. Once that is done, I'm gonna go under the receiver tab and I'm gonna set my receiver as a serial via UART receiver mode. And under the receiver provider, I'm gonna select Crossfire. Now you may be saying, hey, wait a second, shouldn't I select ELRS here? And the answer is no. ELRS uses Crossfire as its actual protocol and provider. So we're gonna select that here. 
We're going to turn on telemetry and very important, we're going to make sure to select the proper channel map. So by default, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see here um, aileron, elevator, throttle, and yaw. If you do it this way, if you forget to change this, you're going to get throttle and your quad's going to go left and right instead of going up and down. So we need to change this over to JR and then we're gonna click on save. At this point in time, you are done with Betaflight. Next, we're gonna switch over to the Express LRS Configurator, and this is the software that you use to do all the firmware flashing and the setup of your ELRS devices, whether it's a transmitter module or a receiver, we are going to use this. I'll give you a link to the software in the video description. So as of filming, we are 3.1.2. We're gonna select our device, so ours is a happy model, 2.4 gigahertz. And if you get confused, the happy model website will tell you what to select here, the targets. So ours is the EP2400RX, we're gonna select that. And you can see lots of these are already preset. All I've done is I've checked on my regulatory domain and I've set my binding phrase. So this is the phrase I use for all of my ELRS devices. So this allows them to kind of seamlessly bind together. And at this point, because it's the first time I'm doing this, I'm just gonna do a build. So I'm just gonna click on build and it's gonna take a few minutes to create me a firmware file. All right, and we can see that it has created my firmware file. And now the next step is we need to get this uploaded somehow to our receiver. And the cool thing with ELRS is the receivers have Wi-Fi. And if you leave the receiver plugged in for about a minute with no connection to a transmitter, it will automatically activate the Wi-Fi. So I've already done that. So if I come here, I should see Express LRS RX. So I'm gonna click on that. I'm gonna say connect. And if it asks you for a password, the password is Express LRS. And once you connect to the Wi-Fi of the Express LRS, it will actually pop up this page here automatically. If it does not, open a web browser and navigate to 10.0.0.1. And this is now the way you can access the settings of your receiver. But more importantly, this is how we can do an update. So we're gonna come over to the update tab and it's gonna say firmware update. We are now going to point this to our firmware file that we just generated. So we're gonna click on that file, we're gonna say open, and then we're gonna say update. And then once you've done that, you are complete and everything should connect automatically. Now, how long yours takes to actually go into the Wi-Fi mode is set based off of this value here. So you can see mine is set to 60 seconds, which means it takes one minute of idle time on the receiver, which means not connected to anything before it'll go into the Wi-Fi mode. So you can change this if you prefer something a lot quicker. All right, so now that you're up and running, let's go ahead and do our first flight. And this is gonna be a real life kind of flight on the EP2. If you're interested in more of a range penetration kind of comparison for the EP1 and EP2, I'll link you to a video I recently did on this in the video description. Hey folks, it's Mangrove from the Future here, and I've already gone ahead and done the test flight on the tiny EP2 receiver. So I recorded the whole video. I was about to publish it, and then I noticed a bit of a surprising behavior on the link quality percentage with this receiver. And the link quality is the percentage of packets that are being received by the receiver. So typically, you know, we look for that uh, 100%, 90%, something very high kind of percentage rate. And with this receiver, I kept seeing link quality warnings and I saw that that link quality was going down to the 80s and the 70s and not something that I'm used to based on my experience with Crossfire. So I went ahead and I redid all the test flights and I'm testing now in a couple of different uh, settings. So initially I tested with you know, 250 Hertz on the link and dynamic power. So now I'm gonna be doing 250 Hertz dynamic power, 150 Hertz dynamic power, but also 250 hertz with um, 250 milliwatt of power locked, so I can see how that impacts link quality. I'm also gonna do a flight on this guy. This is the more traditional EP1 receiver that has the external antenna. So we're gonna see how they kind of compare and how the link quality looks like on the various settings. 
Here's our first test. This is with the EP1 receiver, which is the receiver that has the normal antenna on it. We're running dynamic power and we are looking at 250 hertz. I want you to keep an eye on two things in the OSD. The first one is the link quality, and the second one is the power output of the transmitter. And unfortunately, it looks like the exposure is not fully fixed here on the O3, even with the latest firmware. So still looking a little bit dark, but Seeing this, I see that the transmitter is locked to its lowest power output, which is 10 milliwatts, and the link quality is looking pretty good. So this tells me that the receiver is quite happy and it's not calling for any more power. We saw it go up a little bit to 25 milliwatts, and our link quality is holding. I saw it go down to high 80s, mid 80s, but again, at 250 hertz, that is still perfectly fine. Now we're over to the EP2 receiver. That's a tiny receiver and we are flying dynamic power and 250 Hertz. I want you to look at the same statistics in the OSD. And here we see that we're already up to 25 milliwatts. I'm seeing more variation in the link quality. And as we come around this corner, we all of a sudden see that our power goes up to 250 milliwatts. So it's struggling at this point. It's calling for more power from the transmitter but it still flies perfectly fine, but definitely it's asking for more power because it's having a bit of difficulty retaining that signal strength. Now, next test, we're looking at the same exact thing except 150 Hertz versus 250, and we're seeing that there's a little bit better link quality here because we know there's more sensitivity at lower Hertz uh, frequencies. And as we come around the same spot, we see we are now on 10 milliwatts. We're not being forced into 250 like the prior test, which tells me that the receiver in exact same setting, or not say exact same situation, but 150 hertz is performing better. And now we're still looking at 10 milliwatts here, and link quality is sticking to the 100 slash, you know, kind of low to mid 90s. So perfectly fine and perfectly flyable. Now our next test here, this is where I'm actually locking the EP2 receiver and the transmitter to its maximum output, which is 250 milliwatts at 250 hertz. And we're trying to see what happens to our link quality. So we can see link quality is holding close to 100. Oh, it just came down to high 80s, kind of low 90s. And I get a little bit more adventurous. I go the long way around just to really test and see what happens in terms of link quality. And we can see the link quality is holding pretty good. And we know that the 250 hertz causes link quality to struggle a bit more on the EP2 receiver. But in this situation, we're not that far away. We're blasting 250 milliwatts. So no surprise that link quality is holding pretty steady and pretty happy. I do a little bit of a split S just for good measure. Again, link quality holding 100%. So this situation it is quite happy, which I don't see why it wouldn't be. Having spent a couple of weeks with the modified Tango 2 Pro with the internal module, very happy with how this is performing. So much so that I've purchased a new antenna. This is a Moxon antenna. Link in the video description. I'm going to try this out later. But let's talk a bit more about what we saw with the receivers and the performance. So going into this, I, I never expected that the EP2 with the tiny antenna would, would ever perform as good as a normal receiver with an external antenna. But I was a little bit surprised at how much it, um, I hate to use the word struggle, but how much of a link quality reduction I saw with this particular receiver, especially at a high refresh rate. So at 250 hertz, you know, we just saw link quality that was lower than what I'm comfortable with. And I wasn't flying too far from myself. I was, what, a football field, maybe a football field and a half away from myself. And we just saw link quality numbers that was too low for my taste. Now, if you run this at, let's say, 150 hertz or perhaps even lower, it seems to perform fairly well in my test and my particular use case. But having said that, I think this is good for those situations where you're flying close to yourself. You need to save every little tiny 0.1 grams. And that's just not my case here. 
So what I'm going to do is, having tested this, I'm going to change this quad back into the EP1. So I've got already the mount here for the antenna. And just look at this, the antenna is so small and weighs so little that if you can fit it, might as well use that receiver instead. And the other factor is, you know, I was flying in a wide open space. I want to make sure that I've got plenty of, kind of headroom if I ever hit an edge case. So let's say I'm flying, I go behind a building, I split as a really dense tree. I want to make sure I've got that receiver sensitivity headroom to keep me covered, especially when my module and my transmitter is restricted to 250 milliwatts. I just want to make sure that I'm protected for any kind of weird scenario that ends up happening out there. But again, this receiver is a feat of engineering and it's got its place in the market out there and it may work for your particular use case. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. Make sure to like, subscribe and comment and stay tuned for more videos.